connected here to that? I am connected, but then I cannot see how can I share my slides with them. Can they hear it? Cancel the presentation, please. Check if they're able to. Oh, uh, you're on the audio, right? Here? Yeah. Okay. Guys, can you hear us? I can hear you, guys. Can you hear me? Hey, Attila. Yeah, I can hear you faint, but we can hear you. I'm wondering if um, Illinois, the host, is able to hear us. And also, can you see the slides? Like, can you see it with the food, like in the presentation mode, or? If, if it is in presentation mode, it will be easier to do. Yeah. Can you see it now? Yes, I can see that. Is this in presentation mode? Is this better? Yes, now I can see all of you. Perfect. How would you like to be able to see us there? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, project it on the screen maybe. Yeah? Or connect the audio. Yeah, they, they can't hear you, can't that, so did they say anything there? Can anyone hear me there? Is it is the audio okay? Apparently not. I'm not seeing quite the answer. Is that better? Alright, yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Is Attila there? there? Yeah, we can hear you now. You can, if you can speak a little closer to the mic, that would be better. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. So my name is Chris Benson. Today I'm presenting um, the project about low-cost, scalable, and practical post-quantum redistribution systems. This is the agenda of, of uh, this talk for today. So I'm going to start off by giving you a background, basically, on on crypto and post-quantum crypto, and then we're going to move on to the objective of this of this project. And we're going to talk a little bit about post-quantum um, public key infrastructures and how to achieve them. And then we're going to talk about FOSS scheme. This is a basically a signature scheme that we uh, proposed with Prof. Attila to um, enhance the security and efficiency of the existing signature schemes, which include post-quantum signature schemes as well. And then we're going to talk about the adoption of, of quantum key distributions in our um, quantum, uh, post-quantum secure framework. So um, for 
critical infrastructure. We have adversaries who want to basically false, uh, sorry, inject false data, uh, tamper commands from the command centers to, to, for example, PMUs, which could basically lead to cascade failures as well. So what we can do is that we can use cryptographic measures to uh, uh, address these attacks. By cryptographic measures, we can use authentication to make sure we, can, we would not have any false data injection. We can have public infrastructure to, to ensure the, the exchange of um, authenticated data between parties, and we have key management. So post-quantum cryptography, basically the idea, the threat of post-quantum uh, computers to cryptography was uh, first put forth by Peter Shore. So Peter Shore in 1994 proposed a quantum um, algorithm which showed how fast we can uh, basically use, how, how fast we can factor numbers and solve discrete logarithm problem using quantum computers. Well, at that, 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 at that time, we didn't really have any quantum computers, but in uh, 2001, IBM introduced the first quantum computer which could factor a number 15 to its prime um, numbers, three and, and five. And that was a breakthrough at the time. So that shows basically that if one day quantum computers emerge, which have a better power, are, are, are like RSA and, and discrete, discrete logarithm based problems. So <clears throat> we have to, you know, hurry up to basically come up with standards to replace these conventional cryptographic schemes if, if quantum computers emerge. So we have some estimates uh, that potentially by 2035, quantum computers can break um, large prime numbers, which are as large as 3072 bits long. Um, we have Professor uh, Mosca from um, Waterloo University who stated that there is a one to in seven chance that some fundamental public key crypto will be broken by quantum computers by 2026 and one in two chance of the same problems being broken in 2031. So we know that quantum computers are coming and we know that we are not secure against them. What we have to do is to basically come up with um, schemes, come up with basically measures which are secure against these quantum computers but we have to start soon because the process of coming up with the schemes and then making them into standards could take a lot of time as history has shown. So to kick this off, NIST has started the first round of call for submissions for uh, post-quantum secure schemes. Well, they have started taking submissions. It will be in three rounds and um, they are hopeful that by 2024, they can come up with decisions to, to basically introduce some of these schemes as the um, standards. And we have the NSA coming up with a statement that uh, IAD will initiate tra transition to quantum resilient computers in a not too distant future. So we have the government agencies actually thinking about this um, phenomenon as well. So the objective of this, of this research uh, is to basically come up with post-quantum crypto for cyber critical infrastructures. For, for this reason, not only we consider commodity hardware when we are implementing and testing our solution, we are also doing it on ARM processors. So to achieve this, to achieve a, a post-quantum cyber security infrastructure, to get this infrastructure basically going, we think we need uh, three components. We need a post-quantum signature scheme. We need a post-quantum key enca encapsulation mechanism, which we call CAM. And we need a certificate authority to basically handle, issue, and manage these certificates for us. So why do we need a public key infrastructure? Let's take this scenario, for example. If entity B wants to send entity A the key, then, then what will happen is that we could have, sorry, we could have the adversary in the middle to mediate, get the key from entity B and, and send his own key instead to entity A. So whenever entity A wants to send something to entity B, thinking that the key that it received is from entity B, encrypted with this red key, and then 
in the middle the adversary can decrypt it because he or she knows the red key and then can encrypt it with uh, the yellow key, read it, read the information, encrypt it with the yellow key and send it to the entity B. So this really having no infrastructure in place would not work. The second solution would be to have a trusted third party in place. So what we can do is to have these two parties, entity A and B, um, authenticate themselves, pr prove themselves to this uh, trusted third party and trusted third party would basically keep a list of their private keys. So if entity B wants to send something to entity A, for example, it would use the public key of the trusted third party, encrypt it, send it to the trusted third party, and the trusted third party having all the private keys of the users can encrypt it with the private key of entity E and send it over, and sen since entity E has the, similar, the same private key, it can decrypt it. The problem with this uh, solution is that we need to have a uh, trusted third party always online, and if it's not online, no communication, single point of failure, basically. That's why we think a better solution would be to have an entity to issue certificates on, on users' um, public key. This way, entity A can send uh, its public key or entity B can send its public key to, to entity A or B, respectively, and then send a certificate alongside it. And if we are using the certificates, then anyone in the system can basically verify that this is actually the correct public key. It was not replaced by a, a malicious user or an adversary by simply verifying this, um, this, this public key using the certificate, which was issued by a certificate authority, which I'll show in the, in the, in the next slide. So with, it, with this mechanism, if two users want to communicate, they just come up with a, a shared key, or one of them comes up with a shared key, they encrypt it using the other user's uh, public key and, and send it over along with the, with the certificate of the public key. So this is what we have in mind for a post-quantum secure public key infrastructure. So at the top, we have this uh, certificate authority, um, and we have two users as an example. So we have this PMU on the right side initiating this, this uh, setup, we can call it. It would send this public key in, uh, in, uh, phase, in the first phase to the, to the certificate authority and, and authenticates itself. The certificate authority upon receiving this public key and, and authenticating the user would issue a certificate on it and it can keep a copy or send a copy to the to the PMU and or it can actually have a separate entity which we call a certificate directory uh, to basically store these, these certificates. But I just took it out because I didn't want to make this figure too complicated. So once the PMU, this device on the right side, registers itself sends its public key to the certificate authority and receives the certificate on the public key, then um, it can basically send this key to the, to the, to the other entity along with the, with the certificate or not. And then the, the other entity can either get a certificate, as I said, from this PMU or, or as, as shown in this figure, get it from the certificate authority directly and then using the public key of this entity, it can, they can basically generate a shared key, encrypt it using that public key as it's shown in step five, and then send it to the user. After this, they can simply communicate very efficiently using that um, shared key, the golden key, which was encrypted in step five using the public key of the PMU. So what we need for this infrastructure, we need to have a post-quantum signature scheme to issue certificates, and also a post-quantum encapsula key encapsulation mechanism as shown in step five to basically be able to encapsulate or encrypt the shared key which is to be communicated between the two parties. So to find um, the best or most appropriate of these alternatives of the signature scheme and, and this key encapsulation scheme, we looked into NIST submission. Total we have 23 signature submissions and 59 CAM or encryption scheme submissions. So we look basically into all of these. We, uh, we did the, we analyzed their uh, schemes and assess the implementations. And we found out that basically uh, lattice based schemes are the best alternatives due to too many reasons. One was that the parameter sizes were 
uh, somehow acceptable. They were relatively efficient. The coding of, of these schemes was more manageable. The size of the code that, that is needed for these schemes is, is not too long and it's not too difficult and too complicated to come up with um, secure implementation because that's an important issue as well. If, if the in, in implementation of these schemes is too difficult and basically no one can come up with a uh, secure implementation, then that there would be a problem when this, these are basically adopted in the, in the industry overall. So for the signature schemes, we use dilithium signature scheme. Um, it's, uh, dilithium is obtained from a Fiat Shamir with um, abort transformation. So um, we know that from, from for, uh, for lattice based signature schemes, the most efficient signature schemes that we have, they basically require this sampling from a uh, Gaussian distribution uh, during the signing process. So this is required to ensure that signatures that are generated are secure, they don't leak the key, and also uh, we would have a security reduction. We can show that this signature schemes are basically secure. But unfortunately, this process of, of sampling from a Gaussian uh, distribution during signature generation is shown to be prone to um, too many side channels attack. Well, uh, it is possible to come up with secure implementations, but as been shown in the previous works, the com coming up with this secure implementation is highly difficult and very error prone. So dilithium does not have, fortunately, any Gaussian sampling uh, during the signing process, while it also um, offers efficient computations and, and manageable uh, parameter sizes. Dilithium is based on modulo learning with error and modulus uh, short integer solution. And it basically considers a strong adversary that has virtually as much as space as it has uh, time. So uh, signing and verification is basically dominated. The cost of signing and verification is dominated by shake one, two, eight and shake two, five, six and multiplication in polynomial ring R cube. So if we can later come up with uh, methods that we can implement these three things, elements uh, faster or more efficiently, then we can significantly, you know, improve the speed of uh, signing the speed of dilithium as well. So this is basically a sketch of, of what happens in dilithium. In the key generation, a user basically samples a matrix A of the dimensions of, of K and L. Well, this matrix would have coordinates of, of size uh, no larger than Q. And then it would sample two short vectors, S1 and S2, of distribution uh, S uh, of distribution of, of, of size L and K, meaning that these vectors have L and K coordinates, and also each co each uh, coefficient of this of this of these vectors is not greater than eta, which is defined in the scheme. It's it's a smaller number than Q. Then we have the uh, public key, which is uh, computed by multiplying A with S1 plus S2. For the signing, we would have to basically sample a polynomial, sample a vector called Y from a distribution gamma 1. So meaning that the, the vector Y would be a vector of, of uh, L coordinates and each coefficient of this, of this polynomial of this vector is not larger than gamma 1 and then we have W1 as the higher order bits of, of AY and uh, 2 gamma 2, which is a, another constant that they introduce. And then we generate the challenge C. The challenge C is very specific because um, the, the hash function that they are using would only, so ge it generates a vector, the hash function, it generates a bit string, which we consider as a vector. And then this bit string would have 59 to 61 uh, one, ones and minus ones. The rest uh, of, of these bits are basically zeros. And then we compute the potential signature as Z. We uh, compute, we multiply our challenge C with a, our private key S1, and then we mask it again with Y, because if we don't mask it and we just release S, S1C, then we would leak our private key. That's why we have to mask it with polynomial 1 that we sampled at the beginning of this algorithm. 
And then I said potential signature because we would have a rejection sampling algorithm, meaning that when we compute Z, we have to make sure that Z does not leak any of our uh, private key elements. So we check if Z lies within this predefined range, then we consider it as a valid signature and we output it. Otherwise, we have to basically repeat this uh, whole signature generation algorithm again. Well, based on the parameters that we are considering, the number of repetitions that we have to do is between three times and six times based on the parameters. And, uh, and, the, and the verification of dilithium takes place like almost all of the other um, fiat shamir based schemes. So we compute the high order bits and then we check if, um, if the signature is in the predefined range and then we compute the challenge and then we check it with, with what was sent to us during the uh, signature generation algorithm. Well, this was only the sketch of the algorithm. The, the full algorithm is shown here. It, it, it is more complicated. So what is the difference between this one and the previous one, which was very simple than I showed, is that the, uh, basically the public key here is 2.5 times uh, shorter than what I showed in the previous scheme, but the signature is about 10% uh, uh, longer. So, but the, the, the computations are more or less the same in, in, in respect of, of, of computation-wise, efficiency-wise. So um, we have the implementation of dilithium. Uh, we implemented the dilithium for three different security parameter, uh, parameters, 100, security, 100 bits, 138 bits, and 176 bits, as they proposed in their paper. And then we compared it with the most efficient and most viable solutions that were proposed to um, NIST. So these are basically all NIST proposals except BLIST. We put BLIST here because BLIST is what I talked about earlier, is one of those very efficient signature schemes, but unfortunately it suffers from a Gaussian sampling during signature generation. So it's really not an appropriate alternative for us. Dilithium pro pro uh, provides on somehow on par performance with uh, BLIST, but it avoids the having this Gaussian sampling uh, procedure during the sign algorithm. Therefore, it's not really prone to the, uh, it's not really susceptible, sorry, to the attacks uh, which could um, target bliss. And then, yeah, we uh, implemented all this on a um, Intel i5 6th generation Skylake processor with 2.6 gigahertz and 12 gigabytes of RAM. So for our key encapsulation mechanism, we considered Kyber. Kyber is again a lattice-based um, encryption schemes. Uh, encryption scheme, which um, well in the paper they propose a CPA, which is a normal encryption scheme, and then we show they show that we can use Akamoto uh, transformation to transform this um, CPA normal signature scheme to a CCA signature scheme, which would basically give us a key encapsulation mechanism. So when we look into the uh, NIST proposal, we found out that lattice-based schemes and code-based schemes are most viable due to their performance and also uh, parameter sizes. Kyber is based on Module LWE, uh, and Module LWE is known to have um, less algebraic structure than, than Ring LWE. Well, that means that if a lattice has less algebraic structure, it means that it has less properties to be exploited by the attacker. and uh, in other words, it's more secure. And also, Kyber, because of its uh, structure, is more efficient than the ring LWE based scheme. Uh, one of those ring LWE bases, which had a lot of attraction back in 2015, was New Hope. Uh, but Kyber has been shown to be even more efficient than New Hope. So, this is a CPA version of, of Kyber. The only thing that we do to basically uh, attain a C CCA secure scheme and CHEM scheme from this is to apply the Akamoto transform to it. Well, we would have a rho and sigma as two seeds. We would generate our public key A as within this sit. All right. With this seed, and then we basically have 
two, uh, two uh, functions which are very nice for us called compress and decompress. Basically, these are used to compress and decompress the parameters for us. They would give us better size of public keys and, and uh, ciphertext. So this is what we have. We've implemented um, <coughs> two lattice based New Hope and Kyber <coughs> and two code based schemes. Uh, we used bike so bike scheme which was a code based key encapsulation mechanism had, had three <coughs> variants and we chose the variant which had the fastest encapsulation and decapsulation um, algorithms because that's what we care about most and a little bit of slower key generation because key generation is only being done once so we thought that well it's not of paramount uh, importance for us. So as you can <coughs> see in this table uh, Kyber has been shown to have the fastest uh, encapsulation and, and decapsulation schemes with somehow very reasonable parameters for three different security levels, 128 bits, 192 bits, and 256 bits. So the final product is that we implemented Kyber as our CAM, uh, as our encryption scheme, and Dilithium as our signature scheme. Overall, we found out that the uh, state of post-quantum CAMS schemes is more stable than the signature schemes, but Dilithium is shown to be a very stable scheme, and we have not yet seen any attacks being proposed um, in theory. So uh, we implemented our product on basically commodity hardware and an ARM Cortex-A53. The results are, are shown in these two tables. So the authenticated encryption size is our ciphertext size and our, our um, certificate size that go along together. And our end-to-end -end delay is the time of, of decrypting, sorry, first verifying the signature and then decapsulating the ciphertext, along with, of course, on the, on the sender side, um, the encapsulation time. So in another direction, we actually, by looking at the state of these uh, lattice space signatures, which as I uh, just alluded to, is not really stable, we came up with a new scheme that we call fast authentication from aggregate signatures, because we observed that there are a number of uh, aggregate signatures proposed to, basically there are a number of signatures proposed to NIST, which are post quantum secure, and they have this aggregatable property. So we came up with FOSS, and then what FOSS do is that it converts any s single signer aggregate signature into a signer efficient scheme. We show that FOSS can achieve up to 100 times faster signature generation as compared to its base scheme. And not only it provides with uh, better efficiency, but also it improves the security of these schemes because if we are using FOSS, then we can move that Gaussian sampling algorithm which we discussed that it could be susceptible to sidechain attacks to the key generation algorithm, meaning that when we are generating signatures, there would be no Gaussian sampling and basically no other computation which could be potentially susceptible to sidechain attacks. We have uh, already submitted our paper to Financial Cryptography 2019 and now we are awaiting results. So this is the basic idea of, of what happens under the hood of, of FOSS. So we have all the key generations uh, all happening and, and also all the signature generations happening in the fast key generation um, step. So we have an underlying signature scheme, which we know is aggregatable. We have the key generation for that scheme and then we generate all bunch of basically a couple of tables which contains a number of signatures. During the key generation, we store the signatures as our key and then during the the FOSS signature generation, we basically just aggregate this signature. So the only thing that happens during signature generation of FOSS is just the aggregation, nothing else. So this is uh, when we deployed FOSS on normal traditional signatures and also post-quantum signatures. You can see that for um, when we applied FOSS to a PQ new to sign signature scheme, we basically achieved about 30 times to 100 times faster performance for our sign, for our signing algorithm, whereas the verification becomes slightly, just only two times slower. 
but unfortunately well as any other trade-off uh, we have a little bit of larger uh, private key size for fraud because we have to as I said store all those pre-computed signatures as users private key so we receive a little bit larger uh, private key size we think that this is the only limitation that FOSS has given and given the advantages that it achieves in the sign algorithm this is not actually too bad so in another direction um, that we have so we have another direction that is working with the quantum key distribution systems but this is completely different than what we do so there are devices being um, developed and basically produced, which is shown on the, on the right side. So these devices, what they do is that they generate the keys and then they transmit these keys uh, via um, optical fibers. But these are basically key distribution systems which are um, based on quantum mechanics. So the key that is being transferred, for example, in this figure from Alice to Bob via this optical fiber um, is highly secure. The reason being is that if anyone tries to eavesdrop the key due to the uh, properties of this quantum mechanics, the key would change. So it would be disformed. So we think that this is, a, this is the highest basically level of security that one can attain because the Security relies on the hardness of the physical problem instead of computational problems that we had uh, for ours. The problem that comes with these devices is that they would need dedicated uh, optical fiber channel between the two parties, and then they're rather costly. So each device, give or take, would cost about $17,000. So what we are hoping to do is to bootstrap um, our computational quantum key distribution infrastructure with these quantum key distribution uh, devices, meaning that we are hoping to have these quantum key distribution devices which are highly secure to be put at the command center and then down the hierarchy we use our computational quantum key distribution. So our future goal would be to get our hands on one of these, uh, a few of these uh, quantum key distribution devices and be able to basically bootstrap our, our proposed quantum, uh, post quantum public key infrastructure with these devices, implement the whole system and on actual test beds of a smart grid and try to benchmark the results to be able to provide a good estimate of, of adopting these techniques in the future. So this summarizes my talk. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, I'll be open to answer. Thank you so much, Rupe. Does anyone have any questions or feedback? Oh, Al has a question for you, Rupe. Surprise. Uh, I have a question. In, um, it seems like a good solution for general uh, quantum key security. Uh, specifically, how would you optimize the implementation for an energy delivery system where you have a master-slave relationship and you have a master communicating with a large number of slaves, or maybe similar, you would have a, uh, a, a meter head-end communicating to a very large number of smart meters. So it's, it's kind of a, uh, a, a specialized communication structure, and I'm, I'm wondering if that would allow any, any kind of optimizations. Fortunately, based on well, the schemes that we are implementing, they have a set of parameters. So we have different parameter sets that we can implement in the schemes. We can have, for example, larger keys and more efficient sign algorithm, or a small or smaller keys if the device that we are implementing is on, and less efficient, for example, sign algorithm. So we can basically play with these parameters to achieve the schemes which are appropriate for, the, for, for any, any scenario, as you said, for this master-slave um, between the command center or, for example, PMU, I think we can come up with, given a scenario, we can tweak our parameters to achieve what we want to achieve. I, th I think I just suggested your next paper. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? Any questions or feedback from our phoning in folks? Going once, going twice. Was that someone trying to ask a question? anything back from ORNL folks about, about using their QKE stuff? Is that Attila? Uh, this is Rakesh. Rakesh, Rakesh. Oh, Rakesh. Hi, Rakesh. Um, no, I haven't. Uh, uh, did you want me to sort of follow up with them? No, no. I mean, Attila and I are wondering. Um, I guess we gave them an update of what this problem is. Exactly. So, and so, so what I what I what I thought uh, we had agreed was that we actually, well, when I say we, you uh, and Attila provided uh, the, uh, the the scope and what you guys were doing and uh, what the agreement was that there was no overlap and they would actually contact you guys directly if they had any. Uh, thoughts on sort of like the collaboration, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so we don't we don't have to report back to DOE or anything, right? So we just wanted to. Um, no, we we, we don't. Uh, they they took the action item to actually uh, circle back with Walter and uh, update him to say that there was no overlap between what they were doing and what we were doing. But they also said that if they wanted to see if they want to actually bring you guys in to what they are doing, uh, then they'll reach back to uh, the both of you directly. Yeah, I think it's complimentary, so I think Attila will connect with them, but I guess they're not ready yet, so I think... I guess so, yeah. Yeah, we, we reached out to QB Tech as well, so they developed these QKD devices that uh, Ruzda was talking about. Uh, they also said they would love to integrate the computational QKD with their devices once they have the devices ready. Uh, but, you know, we had a call at about six months ago, right? Yeah, so I think right now, given that the knowledge of the pipeline will go back to the power of the is not able to hear you properly. No, for some reason, the device is very far away. Okay, so yeah, so what I heard is that if you know, check in with Cubitic again because we are ready if, if they can use the devices, right? Okay. Okay. And, and Rakesh and Attila, if if if, 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 if you see in uh, any value in actually publicizing uh, the the progress that you are making with Cubitic, uh, please uh, do so uh, through the reporting channels. Uh, because that's what the DOE is really interested in. So there's motivation by them to actually see us actively engaging with industry. So if you, if you see something that's progressing well, and if you want, if you see, if you see that it's worthwhile and it's a, in a good state to actually report saying that there is successful uh, migration or transition of some of the stuff that you are doing over to Qubitec. Uh, that's the key to actually get uh, that reporting to us because when that comes in, I'll uh, sort of uh, get in touch with the DOE folks and actually get that transition to practice document uh, uh, updated with uh, some of these new stuff. Yeah, we, we, will do, we will do that. And I just want to let you know, I, since I have moved um, and is in Florida now, um, I think by December, Ruth Bay is also going to transition to Florida. So okay. This project will probably not be under credit anymore. And so we're trying to get it, the transition or connection with Cubitec before that. Uh, but the reason I'm asking is, is did you know, express any interest in continuing this in Florida? So that's what I wanted to see if there was any interest. Let's, let's take it offline and uh, touch base. Perhaps. Uh, 
you me and uh, Attila could uh, jump on a call uh, one of these days and we'll uh, we'll try to sort that out how about that sounds good sounds good thank you Thank you, Ruth A. And thank you, everybody else, as well. Thank you. 